And I'm Adam Powell. I am president of the Public Diplomacy Council and director of Washington programs for the USC Annenberg Center for Communication Leadership and Policy. And all of us are partners in these programs. Uh, uh, I see many familiar faces, uh, uh, so uh, welcome back. And I see some newcomers, so uh, welcome and uh, please come back often. Um, we are going to have an issue this time with chairs because AFSA is getting all new chairs and so the next time you come, there'll be all new chairs over for the moment. They've already gotten rid of half of the old chairs. So the ones that are in this room are the only chairs in the building. <laughs> uh, so we're in a transition, as is so often the case. Um, as you see in your program, we have the uh, next two First Monday programs uh, already announced. Uh, in December, it will be the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, and our speaker will be the CEO of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Um, and uh, then in uh, January, we'll have cities and uh, public diplomacy. Um, but today, uh, without further ado, because we have a number of people with some fascinating uh, things to tell us, um, our moderator is going to be Robert Ogburn, who will guide us through this topic. Um, each of the uh, speakers, uh, all the speakers' bios are on the second page of your uh, program. Uh, let me first introduce the uh, Rob, he is uh, just back from three years at U.S. Embassy Seoul, where he was the uh, uh, Minister, the uh, Counselor for Public Affairs. He is now the uh, Public Diplomacy Fellow at George Washington University uh, for uh, uh, 2017 to 2018. Um, he has an amazing background, uh, having served in Korea many times, also having served in critical posts in uh, Vietnam, uh, in uh, uh, Cairo, um, and elsewhere, but uh, he uh, also, before joining the Foreign Service in 1987, he was in broadcasting, investment banking, and law enforcement. So, uh, <laughs> on that note. <laughs> okay. yeah. Th thank you very much, Adam, and thank you so much for organizing this. It's wonderful to see everyone today, to see friends today, and thank you, Professor Steele, for visiting from uh, George Washington University. As Adam mentioned, I uh, transitioned from working in Seoul uh, this past uh, summer to coming to Washington. And uh, often as a, a public affairs officer, when you're at post, when you're overseas, you kind of labor under the illusion that your particular foreign policy issues are like the most important issues and the most important concerns back in Washington. And often, you know, most of the time, you know, for me at least, the bubble has been burst when I come back on vacation or for a Washington tour and realize it's just a small part of all the relationships that the U.S. is involved in. So I was a little bit, I expected a little bit, but actually I was surprised to come back and see that Korea was so much one of the top international news issues and that it continues to be, and especially this week with the visit of President Trump to Asia and all the expected summit meetings that would happen. So we thought since that's one of the most important aspects of the President's Asia trip, It'd be very good to talk about North Korea, but to talk about it from a public diplomacy perspective. I thought it'd be best to have maybe some of the top thinkers about what North Korea is like nowadays, but also people who are doing things with regard to public diplomacy. And of course, in terms of North Korea, probably the most difficult thing is finding the balance. Fi finding the balance in light of our policy toward North Korea and the current situation between raising awareness levels among the public, especially among the decision-making public in North Korea, but at the same time not enabling unacceptable international behavior. So we'll talk a little bit about PD and we look forward to hearing your questions and also maybe your suggestions as well. And we'd like to start with Professor Younggi Kim Reno, who is a professor emeritus at George Washington University, was the prime mover, the motivator behind this wonderful Institute of Korean Studies that was recently launched at George Washington University. She's been a mentor to many Korea scholars and Korea watchers through the decades, and we look forward to hearing her insights first. Any 
PowerPoint experts. Great. Right. I, think I think you've got it. <coughs> Hello everyone, 안녕하세요. Uh, I'm not really a political scientist or North Korea specialist, but I guess what qualifies me here to be here is uh, I, am a, I am from Korea, and what happens to anything that involves America and Korea interests me. And also, when you when you go anywhere, especially in a you know just a un unacademic places, they often ask you when you are when when you say you are from Korea, they even ask, are you from North Korea or South Korea? So this louder, yeah. Let me see. How do you make it louder? <coughs> yeah, I think I'll just hold it. Okay. So. So, uh, is it okay? Yeah, so uh, I am actually a linguist by training, but uh, my horizon began expanding when I first started working at the National Science Foundation as a linguistics program director. And, uh, and uh, as I also uh, kind of established the Korean studies program at George Washington University, I had to deal with a lot more than just linguistic theory, although I kept, I kept my research so that I had my anchor there. But everything is, in fact, uh, interrelated, especially language and everything that goes on in life. So uh, today I, I just want to emphasize uh, maybe one word. Let's try to achieve a civilized world. And this probably is a very hard goal when you deal with uh, the current situation in North Korea. Because uh, often um, when people are in the state of war, they become often subhuman. And I think with, with that uh, preface, I might go through just some bullet points I've um, produced. Traditionally, diplomacy or current affairs, people talked about you know, political situation, the number of tanks, weapons, and the economy maybe at best. When you talked about culture, it was actually a dirty word. It's even in professional fields like uh, economics, uh, suddenly culture is becoming a very important word. And it's uh, not only an explanation uh, for many things, many decisions, many historical events, but also maybe help us guide to make future ones. So <coughs> uh, I think uh, the most important part of studying culture is because we, we can really understand not just what people do, how they do, but the thought processes, the, the foundations of the decisions they make, the fears, hopes, and comfort zone. So when, when you are trying to converse, uh, I think certain points are actually quite helpful to, to know first. Uh, <coughs> let's first uh, try to actually think what public diplomacy means. So this became a uh, kind of official jargon since the, the establishment of the Fletcher School's uh, center 
uh, called Edward Monroe Center for Public Diplomacy. And they, they essentially said what you uh, need is not just the political and economic and the kind of uh, statistical information, but really cultural understanding to, to promote uh, advancement in diplomacy. So this, this will uh, suddenly, uh, not only the, uh, the uh, cultural aspect, but you will have maybe academic, and then especially uh, advancement of life, which in which science plays a huge role. But if I had to define what political science is, I would say it's the study of power. And this power actually is an important factor, not only in political science, you can study the power the role in language, in society, in even church structure and uh, military structure and all that. So it's important to, for, and then everybody wants to be powerful. And that is guided by your, your I mean, cultural values and what the society in large wish. So, uh, so we, in public, public diplomacy, basically we want to promote uh, somehow uh, mutual understanding through which you gain what you want. The problem with the Korean Peninsula is it's a kind of zero-sum game. Both the North and the South uh, are afraid of being unified under the others uh, kind of a system. And this is a very scary thing because it's one of the very few countries where, uh, South Korea is one of the very few countries where they actually experience, experienced the communism under the worst circumstances. So this is a true scale, it's not imaginary square. North Korea, from the North Korean point of view, I'm sure they know very well how, I mean, they used to be a lot richer than South. Lots of, uh, you know, actually even modernization started in the North. They were energy rich, and then suddenly we are so many times richer. South Korea is, and I know they know, and the, the prospect of being reunified under the, the democratic, southern democratic system, I'm sure is really a scary thing. So under the circumstances, how do you actually promote good conversation? <coughs> there is actually an interesting, I'm sure many of you know, there's a very famous uh, British philosopher and linguist uh, who, who taught at Berkeley. And he, he mentioned as a universal principle, a cooperative principle uh, in his book, The Logic of a Conversation. So you have this maxim of quantity. So you, you give just the helpful amount. And then quality, you cannot, you cannot give false information. And maximum of, relation, maximum of relation, be relevant. If you talk really a fantastic thing, but actually not talking about the, the topic you are, you are conversing about, it's not good. And maximum of manner, so you have to be clear, brief, and orderly. When you, when, you, when you observe some of the leaders today, many of them violate this, although uh, Grice proved that even, even in an adverse situation, even talking with a socially uh, you know, the not uh, fami f friendly person, this axiom is somehow kept 
But when, it's bre when it breaks down, what do you do? Because first, you have to believe what the other person says is what he really, he or she means. So I will just go very quickly what might be in the mind of Koreans, because uh, it's a country of pride, both north and south. People will do anything when they feel they are respected. And when they feel they are not, they will also do really kind of very bad things. There's another value, is independence. Korea just had a very terrible experience of being colonized by Japan after many, many, many years of independence. Actually, if you look at Korean history, they had three periods of longest dynast dynasties in human existence. So this was not only an incredible shock, but also they thought Japan was somehow their disciples. And then being conquered by them was even a double whammy. whammy. So they are very, very jealous of being themselves, not, not you know, under any big brother. Of course, Korea had, a, as a public diplomacy, they had, a, they s actually uh, submitted themselves to be a tributary state. But this was an incredible diplomatic tactic, a little bit like what Thailand did toward the Western approach. So uh, by doing that, in fact, Korea was one of the most respected foreign countries by China, especially because we shared lots of cultural uh, belief systems and uh, you know practices and uh, and also a basic attitude toward the human lives. So in order to do this, the most important thing is, uh, again, this is, I'm borrowing from linguistic research, face-saving approaches in any conversation and any civilized behavior. One of the most fantastic things people have actually done and still do is to find a way of you know, saving the interlocutors or counterparts. Uh, so even even if the person made some blunder, like uh, I remember once my mother was visiting and she was served uh, this appetizer, aperitif, the, the wine, and then she insisted taking it to the dinner table. And the host was actually an ambassador <laughs> and I, tried to tell my mother just to leave it on the butler's uh, tray. She, she, since she didn't finish, she kept it. And then you know what the ambassador did? He took his also. This is a, this is a face, face saving device. So this is uh, what I mean. So, <coughs> so what, what can you talk about face threatening acts like uh, it's it's safe to not to talk about uh, maybe politics in some cases. You can go to just purely academic discussions. You have cultural things. We have uh, performance exchanges between North and South. You can be actually doing sports. I wish Korea, both Koreas, will do participate in the Olympics together. This is a, a, a little like a ping pong politics, but uh, they will catch a lot of other things while just playing sports. And then youth exchange, because even in the South, it's, it's, I don't like to see anybody growing with any hate. And you see that, whether it's concerning North Korea or even Japan, I don't like it when people teach young kids just to remember what others did in the past. It is important for them to know, but then somehow I, I like the youngsters to grow happy and, and hopeful for their future. So 
these are just a couple of things I had in mind. But how do you touch the heart of North Koreans? Because when, when you, when you see what they do, sometimes it it looks almost uh, incomprehensible why a person would think that way. But we can appeal to some traditional values. So when when you have a nuclear deal, you want to keep the counterpart to keep the promise. How do you do that? We have actually a saying. It's, uh, it says, Nama Iran Jung Chungum. It's a, 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 a dynamic man. It's, a, it's a just a human being man. Says one thing and he will keep his word. So if you, if you tell them, oh, you are a gentleman, then I think the civilized person will want to do that. Instead of saying, you know, I know you are cheating, I think then they will want to cheat just to live up to the, their reputation. And so my basic point is try to help each other to be gentlemen. How do we help the other to be a gentleman? By being a gentleman ourselves. So, and then seek a common goal for progress, especially we can start with academics. In fact, I invited some North Koreans when I organized a big international conference on Korean linguistics. We almost had them, and then last minute they say something happened, they cannot come. And then I had an occasion to meet the vice ambassador to UN, and the he said, he invited me to come to North Korea. And I said, the current president of the International Circle f of Korean Linguistics is, would like to come with me. And he said, he cannot come because he's American. <laughs> but you can come because your husband's French. <laughs> My husband's a du dual situ citizen. But so this kind of thing was very, um, kind of unsettling. I was not quite willing just to go. The reason why they wanted me to come first is uh, this uh, the ancient tributary thing. If you come see me first, that's better. So that's why they love to see President Carter coming there. And uh, if uh, President Trump came, that would be really a good thing. Since it doesn't matter to Americans, maybe he should go. And, <coughs> and then be com compassionate. You can express your sympathy to whoever is suffering, but you don't have to be condescending because that will be against the principle of faith saving and also uh, the, um, the pride question. So okay, I'm up. So let's believe in possibilities. And then most important thing is to give dignity to each other. I think that is, that is the best maybe hope for our civilized world. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much, Professor Kim. Thank you so much for your uh, insights into the Korean mind and especially into the, uh, the North Korean mind. Maybe next, if I could please ask maybe Ms. Gong, and you're speaking about information flows to North Korea, I believe, and we have a presentation here. Ms. Gong is the uh, bureau chief uh, for Chosun Ilbo, the leading newspaper, and also a very big web presence uh, in Korea, and they're renowned for their coverage of uh, North Korean issues.
Hello, um, I'm In Sun Kang, and I'm as introduced. I am Washington bureau chief of Chosun Daily News. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll just okay. keep it. All right. And I am here as a Washington bureau chief of Chosun Daily News, that's a South Korean newspaper. Um, well, um, I wanna uh, just uh, well, I think this is a very uh, great idea to think of a public diploma, public diplomacy toward North Korea, because these days every day we talk about military options against North Korea. So this is very new, and and um, I mean I think it's very I mean challenging for us. Uh, so I I can start with this I mean the this presentation with the question: Can outside information bring change in North Korea? I mean that's a if we use some soft power, then can we affect something in North Korea? That's my question. So let's let's start with how North Koreans can get international news in North Korea. The official outlet is uh, of the. Have you heard about Nodong Shinmun? That's a North Korean official newspaper published by. Uh, the Workers' Party, so that is kind. That just shows all public. I mean, the policy principles of North Korea. And actually, um, I talked with one of the North Korean defector journalists in Korea this morning to get to know how they use that information. So I talked with him this morning, and he said uh, that No Dong Shinmun, that newspaper, has six pages every day. And one page is allotted for international news, but interna international news in this case is about social socialist countries like China and Cuba and that that group of countries, and there are a few other news is about other countries, which means imperialist countries, United States and. And a few uh, European countries, so that's very rare. But uh, they use that kind of ways to get the, inf I mean, the international news. But the Nodong Shinmun is not for kind of public. It's not for ordinary people. It's a, the readers are very limited in the center of the power. And the second question is um, then: Do North Koreans use internet? The answer is yes and no. Um, I mean, there are a few places that you can use internet. If you go to the uh, the foreign news department of KCNA, KCNA is one of the news agencies in North Korea. As most of the news is written in English, is sent out to other countries. I mean, that I mean, their work is that I mean, the, done by KCNA, and there are government organizations or spy agencies. Who works for, like a kind of a kind of propaganda and other operations to ch to manipulate some things? I mean, the situation in South Korea. Of course, they use internet, and there are Joseon Computer Center that's in Pyongyang, and that's a computer center, so you can use the internet. And there's a People's Grand Library, which is a they call it Inmin Taehaksdang. That means it's like a congressional library. It's a huge library. So it's a kind of a study center for North Koreans. Of course, it's not like open to public kind of freely. And there's another uh, facility in the Mirim University. That is the uh, training center for hackers. So they, of course, they use internet. And just seeing, and I, I just want to show the, it's a national library, as I told you. People can use the internet there, but I don't know when it was taken, but just get the atm atmosphere, how they use the internet in North Korea. And there, as I told you, there are only, uh, the I mean, news media is very limited in that country, so it's re it's really hard to get the, information from other countries but there are ways of getting the information and, and films and soap dramas and shows that is the DVD players mp3 players USB SD card city I mean all they are 
from China. It's kind of a smuggled to the North Korea. And then they, of course, they are radio. It's a, a mostly it's a short wave receiver, so they can get the news of BBC or other uh, the radio news or 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 things from from other countries. So that's very uh, important media that they can get the news from outside world. And what I uh, the number, well, it's it's hard to count, but the number is about 2 million radios are in, in North Korea now. That's a kind of a tentative numbers. And this, uh, I mean, cell, cell phone is one of the most powerful and potentially the most, in, I mean, important and interesting means for North Koreans to get the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cultures or other foreign kind of the news or, or those kind of things. And uh, the number that um, North Koreans have now is 4.4 uh, uh, million cell phones, which is quite big. So, but the thing is, they cannot. It, it's not smartphones that we use these days. So they they can just make a phone call and messages and and those those things. So then there another question is like, then do they have Wi-Fi? That's also yes and no. Mostly it's no, but if you go to the foreign embassy, you, you access the foreign embassy, in that area you may use Wi-Fi, but it's very limited. And the cell phones, I may, uh, I may tell, you, tell you this story. We have a North Korean defector journalist in, South in, in our company, and they, he can cover the story by cell phone, you cannot make a phone call to North Korea in Korea. And uh, even though, I don't know, you, can we make a phone call from China to North Korea? That's limited, but I think it, they can make it. So in the border area, you can make a phone call to other country because you can use the uh, Chinese facilities. So in border area, I mean, you can make a phone call. So the, our reporter from North Korea, he can make a phone call to his relatives or friends in who's living in, in, North, in the border area, then you can get the news from North Korea directly. So that's how we get the news from North Korea. But the, the issue is that um, we cannot confirm it. There's no one that, you know, with, with to confirm that news with a kind of authority. So we had a very um, big difficulty in confirming the story, but anyways, we tried to get the story from directly from North Korea. So, well, um, now I'm gonna introduce this um, diplomat. He retired now. Actually, I, there's a typo. His, his name is John Ev Everard. So it's not B, V, it's V actually. Uh, he was in, in North Korea as a British ambassador from 2006 to 2009. He spent nine, 900 days there. And after that, he wrote a, sto he wrote a book about his days in, in Pyongyang. And I read the book and it was very insightful. And he, he was a great observer of the North Korean society. Even though you are a diplomat, you cannot go anywhere in North Korea. You cannot, I mean, there are lots of, you know, limitations of going anywhere. I mean, it's really hard to get to the local cities or rural areas. The ambassador told me that if he, he wanted to go somewhere in the northern part of the country, he, the North Korean government never say no, but they never give you an admission. So it's really hard to get there. And the, it, this is the part of the interview I did. So I asked him, where did North Koreans get outside information? That's what he said. One of the things that I cannot really understand at all in North Korea is that there is not a lot of means to convey information. And there is no email or cell phone at the time. It's a, it's a, it's a story about 2006 to 2009. But the information is uh, spreading quickly. North Koreans always share information when they are with a friend or family member they really trust. When information comes into a trusting group, it spreads very quickly. I can't believe it. It's, so that's how they circulate information and how they consume the information. So sometimes ambassador was really surprised to know that they knew something 
that their media never told them. So the, the next question I want to share with you is, that any pro do you think there's any problem with the accuracy of the information passed from mouth to mouth? He said, once I told my North Korean friend that I had been to Kaesong Industrial Complex, he told me very precisely and accurately about Kaesong Industrial Complex, what the factory looked like, what the restaurant was like, what music was coming out, and so on. It was an amazing level of accuracy. Of course, the, the person he, the ambassador talked with had never been to Kaesong Industrial Complex. But he, sh but he gathered lots of information from his friends and close you know, family members. That was unbelievably I mean, accurate. So that's how they circulate the information again. The other uh, question I want to talk with you is, uh, so I, I was worried. It could be, I mean, distorted, uh, the information could be distorted in the process of delivery if it's, uh, it's, 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 it's going to, from, from mouth to mouth. What is, he said was that it is normal to do that, but it is strange that it is not in Korea. The way in which information is transmitted from mouth to mouth is surprisingly efficient. North Korea is struggling to control of the flow of information that does not go through media. But actually, they can't do that because from mouth to mouth, I mean, you cannot control them. And the information is communicated through a friend who is the most trusted source of information. And the, m the more interesting the news is, the faster it spreads, which means like uh, if there's some kind of um, scandal in, in a rural area, I mean, it's just a in Pyongyang, you can get to know it in the next day. So it's unbelievably fast. So th it's just by just passing, inf passing information from mouth to mouth, but it's, it's unbelievably efficient. That's how, I mean, the North Koreans understand it. So this is uh, his, uh, I would like to really, I mean, share with the, this insight with you. And I really uh, like this story. So. I think him like, do you think North Koreans are familiar with the outside world? And he said, they know quite a lot. I mean, he tried to talk a lot with the ordinary people in North Korea while he was in Pyongyang. But the most important thing is not to have external information inside North Korea. Pyongyang people realize that they are ignorant of, uh, of the outside world. Then people become curious and they lose faith in their systems, which means, I mean, they got to know some things happening outside of the North Korea, and then they got some information. That when they saw the, the news that they have never seen in their country, or they have seen the soap dramas or the, the shows and everything, then they tried to become more curious about outside world, and they realized that I mean, there are out there a better or the new world, which is totally different from North Korea. So they are I mean, getting to lose in their system and their country. Which, I mean, they, I mean, they are not that stupid, but they are educated. I mean, in their early days, that North Korea is the paradise in the world. I mean, there are lots of unbelievable stories they believe. So. <laughs> I mean, I think so. The soft power, the soft power, is not very powerful in the beginning. But if if you just consume that information and culture and news step by step, and then somehow you are getting skeptical about your system that you believe in your life. So I think this is. I mean, the public policy toward North Korea is very great idea. So even though you are. I mean, your president is talking about military options every day and uh, maximum pressure, but I think you also need to keep going with this idea of a public di public diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gong. It's really, really good to hear your insights about information flow in North Korea and also the level of awareness. Really appreciate hearing uh, media and also academic backgrounds uh, as uh, private citizens. And now we'd like to hear uh, Mr. Lee, an old friend who's been the head of the Korea service at uh, Voice of America, 
uh, for more than a decade. He recently returned from uh, visiting South Korea last week, and he can talk uh, very specifically about what the uh, U.S. government efforts it's are regarding international broadcasting to North Korea. It looks like your PowerPoint's all ready. Uh, by the way, well, I'm not going to use the oh, PowerPoint. I have a video. Uh, so, uh, thank you. My name is again Dong Yak Lee. I'm the uh, chief of VOA Korean service. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I like to talk mainly two things. One, what we do uh, as we are speaking right now, and uh, brand new sort of a, uh, uh, initiative we just uh, took, uh, let's say, several months ago. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, present that with the uh, short video around the end of my uh, presentation. Um, in terms of what we do, um, you know, when you talk about any broadcasting effort to North Korea, uh, you have to think about what kind of uh, you know, people you are trying to connect with. Um, well, people say there are about, what, 22, uh, 23 uh, million people. It's a small country, and uh, you can use sort of like a, a cookie cutter sort of approach, a one size fits all approach. I mean, since it's a small country, it's a small group, it might be just, you know, generic or homogeneous group. Um, actually, based on my experience and based on my, you know, um, uh, practice, uh, it's quite the opposite. I mean, that's, that's the challenging part. Um, when you think about North Korea as a society, as a, as a big audience group, you have to think of it as more like uh, uh, many, many, many cubicles within a society. Uh, why do I say that? Well, if you succeed in delivering news and information to, let's say, Hamgyeongbukdo in some rural parts of the country, that doesn't mean uh, that piece of information will automatically spread to someone in Pyongyang. Uh, as Ms. Kang rightly pointed out, yes, there is a you know, passage of information from mouth to mouth. It is correct. But mouth to mouth circulation within a again, cubicle. Uh, it is very hard to, to go over the uh, uh, Songbun, sort of the social ranking system that the country has for many, many, many years now. So because of that uh, um, you know, very uh, pe peculiar sort of uh, political situation, uh, what you have to do is you have to come up with a very customized content. You have to basically tailor your, your program towards the uh, audience needs in the country. That's why you may have a certain uh, kind of a content for certain particular group of people, and then there are certain kind of a content for the other particular group of people. Uh, you know, when it comes to VOA, we, we like to seek and we were trying to uh, connect with the people inside Pyongyang, the elites. Um, why do I say that? Well, we believe uh, those are the kind of people who are most likely who are in need of uh, information uh, and news from outside. You may sympathize with uh, a lot of people in the ruler area uh, who are you know, pretty much struggling on a daily basis trying to bring food to the dinner table. Uh, but I don't think they are the kind of people exactly who are in need of information uh, compared to people in Pyongyang who are well privileged, who have a better access to housing, social mobility, uh, economic means. Uh, so they even have less motivation to flee the country. But still, you know, quite unsure about the destiny that the country is heading under the young leader. And those are the kind of people who are really, really, really in thirst for news and information from outside. And that's the kind of people, unfortunately, uh, the government is you know, heavily monitoring by putting a lot of restrictions. Um, so we are trying to target the elites in North Korea. And we are trying to come up with a, you know, very customized content uh, to satisfy the needs of the that particular group. And uh, I mean, I cannot uh, give you a hard number, but uh, uh, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the entire population. So we're talking about a little bit what uh, between two and three million 
Uh, that's the kind of number we are talking about. Um, so like I said, in terms of content, our content is very much focused and very much tailored toward the needs of the uh, uh, people. And if you have a chance to talk to any defector, their worldview is quite you know, divergent and different uh, based on what kind of area they're from and what kind of a social background they have. To be more specific, uh, whether they're lawyer you know, to the regime or they're born to the family lawyer to the regime or not. It sort of makes you know, life and death decision uh, on their lives. So um, we all have to sort of consider death factors when you strategize your programming. Um, we have a, if you have a 100%, if you talk about 100%, we have about 60 or 70% of our content is news. And the other is, you know, we have uh, English learning, news, uh, sort of soft type feature programs. Again, why news over, you know, other programs? We happen to believe um, the kind of audience group that we are trying to connect with will be in need of a news over, you know, let's say entertainment programs or music program. Uh, that's why uh, BOA is uh, trying to provide accurate news and information to elites in North Korea. Uh, that's our sort of a, uh, unofficial sort of a statement uh, in terms of our program uh, strategy. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, measurement of uh, our effort. Um, it's extremely hard. I mean, the best thing you can think of is uh, maybe uh, not anything close to in-country study, but uh, maybe indirect survey uh, of uh, North Koreans. When I say North Koreans here, North Korean defectors, uh, maybe you have about 200 to 300 people, uh, respondents, uh, hopefully fresh North Korean defectors. But you should never ever project it to the entire country because if you look at their uh, you know, demographics, uh, it's heavily skewed toward the uh, rural areas. So uh, the kind of audience that VOA Koreans are seeking it, it, it may not be you know, the kind of a respondents that you normally get from the defector survey. Actually, that's one of our challenging uh, part. Um, but again, uh, you know, we have uh, some uh, anecdotes and sporadic reports. And by the way, we dispatched the, um, our own reporter uh, to North Korea, uh, not as a as a tourist. Uh, we we this is official coverage. Uh, one in 2011 and uh, second 2012. And based on that uh, uh, experience, we were able to um, find out that uh, there's a strong presence in Pyongyang, particularly among uh, North Korean officials, uh, you know, about VOA. Uh, one very uh, strong, I mean, anecdotes I can share with you is, uh, I think it was uh, 2014, uh, South Korean News Channel carried a very interesting report and it was about uh, North Korea's secret newspaper. I, I say secret newspaper because uh, Nodong Shimon uh, that Ms. Kang uh, talked about, I mean, it is circulated among, uh, you know, maybe not ordinary citizens, but officials, but still it's a official newspaper and it's a public newspaper. But this so-called reference newspaper is a secret newspaper. You never take it out from the library what you do is you're allowed to read the newspaper inside the library and you have to hand it over to a librarian after reading it. And that particular news channel obtained the uh, two weeks copies of that newspaper, reference newspaper. And it was mostly about international news. And actually we've talked to a number of defectors and the purpose of the newspaper is uh, the regime is using that newspaper to educate uh, their senior officials about what's going on outside. I mean, even in North Korea, I think there's a genuine need for the government to use accurate you know, information so that they can educate their own followers and associates uh, about political developments around the, around the country. 
And uh, there were about 30 um, media organizations or news outlets south cited in that uh, newspaper and uh, VOA uh, Korean topped the list, followed by NHK and Itaratas and you know other uh, foreign news. I mean, we thought about it. Why? Why VOA Korean topped the list? Um, I think number one, it was the for the sake of a convenience. I believe we were the only Korean language uh, media outlet that provided, you know, news and information on uh, international politics. It's not only about uh, you know what is going on between Washington and Pyongyang, but you know what happened in Africa, earthquake in 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 China. Um, so. That's one number one. Number two, I think we are the most comprehensive news organization uh, in terms of coverage of uh, international news. So that sort of uh, made us, you know, open our eyes because we thought when it comes to North Korea, we on, we only think about, you know, there's a nuclear issue, and then human rights, and humanitarian needs. Those are the only three areas you you only think about. Uh, but small circle maybe selected a group of officials, uh, there's a genuine need uh, for news and information, accurate news and information from outside. So w our team is uh, trying to utilize uh, that as much as possible to our advantage. Um, I think I can talk about the our new uh, initiative, and that is um, um, we are actually producing uh, video contents. I mean, a lot of people maybe in this audience might say, so what's, what's the news, what's the deal? I mean, VOA and any you know, broadcaster trying to reach North Koreans, including RFA, um, has been you know, relying on you know, radio for many, many, many years now. For VOA, for many, many decades, actually. And uh, don't don't get me wrong. I mean, radio has been and radio is the most viable delivery means for us. Uh, still, uh, the interesting information is uh, the most common form of media inside the country in North Korea is not radio; it's a television. If you look at the ownership. And you even look at the uh, you know viewership. It's not radio; it is television. So there's a mismatch right there. I mean, we've been depending on radio for many many decades now, but people inside North Korea are actually using television over radio. Uh, yes, there, there there are certain people who have to depend on radio for any type of information. Uh, the other factor uh, is. Uh, the regime, uh, I think Ms. Kang also said that, that there were maybe as many as, what, two million radios inside the country? Yes, uh, I think that's an accurate number. But as early as, I think, 2000, uh, the Kim Jong-il regime, the father of uh, Kim Jong-un, the current leader, put a lot of, a lot of emphasis on restricting uh, the radio, the use of radio, because they realized Radio has been very powerful tool for many, 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 you know, uh, officials and ordinary citizens uh, to get outside information. That's another another challenge. So that sort of led us to really, really work hard to explore any type of a, you know, I'm not saying alternative, but any type of a additional platform that we can use, and we knew you know, television and visual products were the most common inside the country. The only, the only p issue is how we deliver, you know, video contents uh, to the country. It's a, st it's a still very challenging, you know, uh, issue. But um, I think we, we already have enough sort of uh, evidence that we have to prepare for potential opportunities in the future. So for that reason, uh, VON and RFA, uh, with the fresh money from Congress, uh, are producing high quality uh, video contents. And we place them uh, on YouTube channel right now. And it's a public, you can, you know, you can watch them. 
And uh, uh, VOA and RFA has a very specific, unique, different roles. So if you look at those programs, you'll have a clear idea about what RFA does and what VOA does. But uh, right now, I'm going to show you about three-minute uh, video content. nuclear weapons capability has been growing, but is probably a few years away from having the capability to strike the U.S. homeland. Once a new administration looks as soon as possible, it would be appropriate. Even though we don't trade with North Korea, their money goes through our banks, and that gives us tremendous leverage to go after those that are in violation. Sanctions are to be used. 세계적인 한반도 전문가와 함께하는 깊이 있는 분석과 치열한 토론. 멈추지 않는 북한의 핵실험과 미사일 발사, 긴박하게 돌아가는 한반도. 오바마 대통령은 동맹국들과 함께 하는 결의안을 만장일치로 채택한 미국 하원은 비핵화를 추구하는 것이 미국의 일관된 입장이라고 밝혔습니다. 신나영의 신나는 영어 배워볼까요? 이런 상황에서 쓸수 있는 영어 표현 뭐가 있을까요? 예를 들어서 그 레스토랑 어떤지 잘 모르겠어. 음식은 맛있는데 서비스가 별로. Stay easy and speak easy. 주제지 최북단이에요. 베나탄도 가깝고 인구 한 2만 명. 영어 물론 그러면 이동대 와 살아야 해. 진짜 편리하고. 많은 문화들을 접할 수가 있잖아. 제가 좋아야지 남한테 얘기를 할수 있잖아요. 이 한민족의 문화라는 게 뭐냐면은 현대를 사는 우리 한국인의 정체성이 되는 거예요. 한식에서 쓰는 족발은 손님들이 와우 하는 그런 이펙트를 가지지 않을까. 아, uh, by the way. This three-minute video is a uh, snapshot of uh, what we have already produced and uh, what we are going to produce. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Greta Van Susteren. Um, and I've been to North Korea three times in the last 13 years. Um, I do not pretend to be an expert in uh, North Korea, DPRK as they would, would want to be called, or, um, and I don't think anybody can be, certainly after having only gone three times. But I have a couple observations that have colored my interpretation of what is a problem that I have no answer for and apparently nobody else in the world does. Um, first of all, I don't think nuclear weapons are only fear. I think biological weapons are. 30,000 artillery weapons faced at, um, at, at South Korea that would be man-to-man -man combat in order to fight would be catastrophic. Um, so you know, th the problem can't be um, understated. But he here's what sh always surprised me is um, when I went there, they're afraid of me. And since 1953, they think, they think we're all at war with them. All of us in this room are at war with them. On a Saturday night, because the minders that I had, had with me, I'd say to the minders, what do you think I do on a Saturday night? And they think I'm training 
to kill them. And I said, no, no, I'm trying to decide whether to order pizza or carry out Chinese food, what movie we're going to watch. And I said, that's the way most Americans are. But they, they are so much in fear of us, and they are so isolated from us, and so hermetically sealed from us, they don't even know us. And it's very hard to have public diplomacy when we, we have, we're trying to have public diplomacy with people we can't communicate with who don't, e don't have any understanding with us because we have no sort of exchange. Sanctions, they apparently haven't worked because look at where we are with the sanctions. That hasn't worked. And of course, the hierarchy um, aren't poisoned by the sanctions because they take everything from the people who are way down the totem pole, and those are the people that are hurt. So sanctions, which is always a problem, we, we do the best um, that we can. Um, but they, they are absolutely terrified of us, and they don't know us. But here's, um, here is probably something that has stuck with me, is that um, I do have a relationship with um, DPRK, having been there, professional. I'm a good American. And I travel to New York periodically to talk to the New York mission because they can't come to the United States. They can't come here. They can't travel beyond 26 miles. And the last time in August that I met with the ambassador there, he said something that's absolutely shocking, which just sort of highlighted the spectacular difference in how we look at things. And we have a very candid discussion. He said, can I ask you something? I said, sure, ask me whatever you want. He said, why did America get so angry with us when we returned the college student? And that's Otto Warmbier, the college student. He said, we didn't ask for sanctions. We didn't ask for medicine. We didn't ask for food. We didn't ask for anything. We just returned him. And I said, well, you returned him dead. He said, yes, but we didn't ask for anything. I said, but he's dead. But you know, it was—it just so highlighted the incredible disconnect, and so you know, and you know, it's just incredible disconnect because they're—they're they're so you know. So here's my question to the panel: Is it seems like the only thing that the United States keeps saying, diplomats, Republicans, or Democrats say, well, we'll get China to do it? Well, China has not done it in decades, and China, I don't think, has that economic influence that we all sort of hope because there are other nations there, Iran's in there, other nations are in there, and I, I think we have this sort of myth in our head that China has all this power over over North Korea. I think that power has diminished significantly. So where where are we now on this? So it's like we all just, you know, I think this is, you know, I, I don't have a solution, but perhaps the four of you who study this have sort of a better idea. Um, but uh, maybe, you know, it's, I certainly appreciate a, a cultural exchange, get them to know us, us to get to know, know them, but it is so far beyond that. Um, so that's my thought. Okay, yes. Um, I was once invited to a very small breakfast meeting with the UN ambassador who somehow traveled to DC. And at that time, South Korean rice was uh, delivered to North Korea, but they didn't allow them to, to put the South Korean flag. So s somebody in the audience asked the, the ambassador. This is the North Korean. Right. UN and uh, I think his name was Ho. And uh, so, why do you accept the rice if you don't want them to show who's giving it? Can you guess what he said? We just, you can imagine all kinds of explanations. His answer was, What rice? <laughs> so, I think. If you are talking about public diplomacy, you cannot corner a person when there cannot be a reasonable answer, at least to keep his face. So I think that probably is the first step. Let's not talk about it when you know obviously what atrocities have been done. This is not the step you should take because then you are just cutting any further conversation? That's my opinion. Um, I, I think the ambassador or, or mission 
much for in, in North Korean representative in North Korea. I don't think he was allowed to say anything that he can, he want to speak. I mean, there's a kind of principles that he should say, so I don't think he can just go out of that thing. As the one of the anecdotes that I know is that one of Australian uh, the diplomat met North Korean uh, diplomat, and then Australian uh, diplomat tried to explain something or persuade them to do something. North Korean diplomat read the, their constitution all the way. So that's extreme w kind of way of communicating for North Korea to communicate with other countries. And then the public diplomacy, I understand, is not targeting the elites or or the, the diplomats or someone high up in North Korean system. The, the di public diplomacy, I think it works when it's just heading to the North Korean ordinary people who really do not understand outside world. Um, l l let me just I'll briefly try to answer your question. Uh, as a journalist, I'm, I think, a little bit um, limited to can you can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know whether it makes any <laughs> difference if I stand up, but uh, I'll try. Um, I, I've been following North Korea um, as a writer and slash reporter uh, since 1992, so it's it's been a while. Uh, still, how to resolve the nuclear stand up, uh, let alone other issues uh, in, in relation to the country still really beats me. I mean, um, a lot of people uh, told so, and uh, I was one of them uh, who really believed that we really had a chance uh, during the Clinton administration, but it turned out to be, uh, even the in the agreed framework, there were a lot of, uh, you know, miscommunications and, uh, you know, misconcepts and uh, all kinds of uh, things that we haven't realized during that uh, during the negotiations. So um, I don't think there is a one clear answer. Uh, one thing I can tell you is uh, uh, we are talking about information here. We are talking about public diplomacy. Uh, I can safely say that, that that's one of the areas that the US and outsiders have not invested much yet. Um, we have done a lot in terms of uh, you know, political negotiations. We have done a lot in terms of uh, other things, but I would say that I would argue that uh, you know public diplomacy and the information business is the least explored and studied area when it comes to North Korea. Thank you. Our next question will be from Greta Morris. Yeah, thank you uh, very much uh, for a really uh, interesting program. Um, we're. Uh, right now in a very sort of um, a tense and difficult situation with North Korea with experts like uh, Richard Haas saying uh, that uh, there may be a 60 percent chance of uh, of a nuclear con confrontation in the near future so I'm just wondering um, I, I applaud uh, all the public diplomacy efforts and particularly this this new program from from the Voice of America which I think is 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 marvelous but I'm just wondering uh, are there things that can be done in the area of public diplomacy that might help in sort of lowering the tensions right now uh, to um, to reduce the chances of a nuclear confrontation with the North? Thank you. Um, <laughs> since I'm. Uh, I'm with the Voice of America, maybe. <laughs> um, I think public diplomacy takes time. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but um, you know, VOA has been broadcasting to North Korea, well, to be exact, to the Korean Peninsula uh, over 70 years now. Um, and a lot of people are questioning the validity and then why you know, do you even fund that type of uh, efforts if it doesn't make any real difference at all. Well, my argument is, you know, we are we are really dealing with a tough opponent. 
you know, think about the all kinds of systematic campaign and efforts that the regime has been making. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate that aspect. Um, to me, um, I would not say we're just beginning, but we still have a long way to go. Hi, uh, is it still, is it on? Yeah, okay, sorry, uh, Natural Help and Peace Films. So my question is, uh, following up what the lady in the back said, um, has there been any effort to do public diplomacy to the American people, reminding the American people that the Korean people are not the Korean regime, and that any military action would probably hurt the people of the country who are just trying to live their lives more than it would hurt the regime, and that that should be taken into account, and to pressure our government likewise? I think uh, there have been small efforts by academics, like uh, there are exhibitions of North Korean paintings and things like that. I think the important thing is people realize they are actually quite hardworking, intelligent people, and uh, they maybe are, as a group, very unlucky to have met a leader that may, may not be the best for them. But the, I, th I think people also uh, kind of underestimate North Korea as a whole. I had a colleague who went to North Korea to teach in, the, in their mathematics program. He was shocked at the high level of the students he taught in a summer program. So they are incredibly, they are not like other poor countries. They are incredibly well educated and they believe in education. This is our traditional value. They live and love education every minute of the day until they die. That's a, that's a Korean value. So when you take advantage of those somehow to lead to a conversation, I think I know anything serious takes time. But you can have a very sudden change. I mean, Germany didn't unify through a long process. You just need some kind of impetus. I think if President Trump came to North Korea and showed a, a side he never did before, I think it could it could it could work very well. And and of. Of course, as a man of word, he needs to keep his word. So he will be measured against his own word too. But he can always find a way out, putting uh, maybe a cultural diplomatic type of condition. What an intriguing idea. Um, Arnold Zeitlin, you've been in that part of the world for decades. My name's Arnold Zeitlin, and uh, I used to do business with Jan Happen. Seoul for many years. <coughs> Two quick questions. One, is, is South Korean public opinion behind President Moon's approach to North Korea? And two, uh, since the Trump ad, uh, administration, has that had an impact on South Korean uh, uh, views of the United States? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the first one is that um, the President Moon's approach to North Korea, uh, the support were, I mean, it's kind of divided. Uh, I mean, when you, uh, it's really hard to uh, say. I mean, well, when you, w Koreans think we need to resolve the North Korean nuclear issues, I mean, we should do that. But on the other side, could you take a risk of having war with North Korea? No. Then. Okay. I didn't know that's open. All right. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I it's really, really hard to to get the bridge. So the the opinions divided. 
uh, over the issue. And, and then, how actually, I forgot the number of the polls now. I cannot, f I, I should find it. But, um, s I mean, there are lots of concerns and worries about the security, the possibility of war and the other side. I mean, we cannot just live as it is. So that's really hard to know that. And the President Trump, uh, the second question, President Trump really affected the South Korean image about United States because, I mean, I mean, President Trump has said lots of things about South Korea. I mean, like uh, you need to pay more about the the U.S. troops in in South Korea, or if you don't want to pay that, you can just do by yourself. I mean, you can have your own nuclear weapons. So um, that's uh, what we understand so far is that America, United States, is quite responsive. They it seems to us that they are really responsible and they are the country who uh, the country that committed a lot for our security and that the, the treaty between i mean the, the alliance but these days um korean many koreans think we can be abandoned for u.s interest or or their their position so i mean i just if i just put it in an extreme way I mean, that's how people feel about that when they listen to what President s said every day in their hi in his tweets. Is it done? So I was wondering, because uh, you were talking about journalism, uh, so how can you bring different views from the actual views that were in, in Korea when you are bringing new new people uh, to journalism because in Korea there were like traditional news presenter uh, that were like famous in the history so with new faces how can you be trust that's my question how can you make the people trust you Quickly, how, the media? how can the people in Korea trust the new media with new faces when they are used to like traditional presenters are you talking about when you say Korea, North Korea or South Korea? Sorry, North Korea. So how can you make North how Koreans the people believe? in North Korea trust the new media with new faces right. when they are used to traditional conductors okay, in television? Thank you. For I, I, I think this is excellent question. I mean that this is one of the key you know, challenges we face pretty much, you know, every day. And the only way to overcome that that challenge is just, you know, just to provide accurate news and information. I mean, if you if you uh, look at VOA Charter, it says you have to win trust over your audience. I mean, it's a strong word. Winning trust of uh, North Koreans, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a daunting task. There's no easy way out. Uh, the only way is you just have to make your audience genuinely believe what you say, which is just you know abide by very rigorous journalistic guidelines and uh, just provide accurate use, of use and information. Uh, I think that uh, you've hit on it very directly when you've talked about credibility. And one would be absolutely amazed if one looks over the history of broadcasting and relations even with North Korea and <coughs> South Korea. I'm reminded of the uh, story of the very, very able researcher at one of the institutes here in Washington who has been given access to the North Koreans, oh, since the early 90s. And I think he's been on three or four or five trips there. And one of the most interesting developments during that time was when the North Koreans' families received him in their homes. 
Now, I'm not sure whether it was a rural family or an uh, urban family, but probably an urban family. And Pu Young Young Radio TV, TV actually at that time, was showing footage of demonstrations in the South. And those demonstrations showed people with long banners parading down the streets in protest to the South Korean government. And one of the ladies in the household said, look, look at those banners. We could make 15 dresses out of those. <laughs> now, you know, that's certainly one example of credibility, but I think an even more current one is this year when a man who defected from very high ranks in uh, North Korea to London, he was ambassador to London for a while, and then he came back to the foreign ministry for a while, and then he defected and is now located in Seoul. Now, he didn't really say this on the air for The Voice of America, but it was unmistakable to the two reporters who interviewed him. He said at the end of all of that, uh, you know, I think you will someday be responsible for the reunification of the Koreans because of the honesty of your reporting. In fact, I know that it's honest, because when I was there and working in the foreign ministry, it was required two times a day that we study the VOA program concept, the, the transcripts of that very day. Now, there's no better set sign of the power of credibility and of the new Korean service, and by the way, we should say that Mr. Dong is a fairly new chief of that service, and they're really moving into the new age. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that, that same former North Korean diplomat really called for increased information flows into North Korea. Just wanted to thank everyone for coming to this session. I'm happy to chat with you more informally uh, at any time. Please come up and visit. I'm at the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication with the uh, director of the Institute, uh, Janet Steele. But thank you so much for uh, esteemed panel for, for coming and, and sharing your insights. And for just maybe a little bit irreverent, but we have a slight clip that Adam kind of flagged for us that and about information flow. And also a quick PS that uh, we are we should have some very interesting data next year. Uh, the Broadcasting Board of Governors has uh, commissioned uh, uh, the most uh, elaborate public opinion survey that we can do in North Korea on media consumption, and those data should be available sometime next summer. They're going into the field in January and will be uh, publishing data sometime in the late summer. Uh, but yes, there's a clip which uh, I flagged after a couple of people I spoke to mentioned it. Uh, they said, oh, we've seen this uh, a comedy show, which was an entire half hour about North Korea on HBO. And so here's one particular That was a karaoke version of We Are The World set to New York in flames. <laughs> and the last time I saw a karaoke song with background imagery that inappropriate was Every Time I Have Ever Sung Karaoke. <laughs> I don't know what LL Cool J's doing it has to do with these two babies in a field of sunflowers, but it's making everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> so the North Korean regime has been very careful about presenting a, a threatening image of Americans to its people, and some activists have actually been trying to undermine that by sneaking information into the country on USB drives. We send various content, from stories on human rights, general information on South Korea, to images depicting the average American. Or a fictional version of the average American, TV shows like The Mentalist and Desperate Housewives. Kong says scenes like this one from NCIS Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. That show police officers reading suspects their rights are especially useful. You know what? If nothing else, we finally have our answer to the decade-long question, who the fuck is watching NCIS? <laughs> it turns out it's all your mom's friends and the people of North Korea. And if you think about it, that is very dangerous for Kim Jong-un, because if people get a sense that the image of America that he has carefully painted for them is false, he could have huge problems. And when you understand him in that light, as a dictator desperately hedging against a loss of power, it is possible to understand why all his recent threats against the United States have been reckless, but in his mind, also rational. 
And that brings us to the key question here. What are we going to do about this? Because on the campaign trail, Donald Trump made it all seem very simple. They said, would you speak to the leader of North Korea? I said, absolutely. Why not? Why not? And they come out, Trump would speak to him. <laughs> Who the hell cares? I'll speak. Feel guilt-free, feel guilt-free when you're watching your favorite TV show. You have no idea what second or third order consequences it could have for people on the other side of the world. And like, as I said at the beginning, it's going to be a very interesting time. It's a chance, it's an opportunity for President Trump to meet the Korean people firsthand, to talk to the, to the president in Korea, and it'll be very interesting to, to see what comes out of that. So once again, thank you very much, Adam. And, and also a PS. The gentleman in the back of the room, Alan Saunders, thank you. He does everything from chairs to video to audio. So thanks to Alan and your, and your colleagues at AFSA. Our next program, the first Monday in December, 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan with the CEO of the German Marshall Fund of the U.S. Until then, we're adjourned.